Okay, so thank you all for joining us today for the final CDD forum lecture this spring with IFOMA EBO. My name is Marie Law Adams and I'm a lecturer of urban design here at DUSP. This meeting will be recorded so that it can be shared later on DUSP's YouTube channel. So I'm gonna start the meeting with our land acknowledgement. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. I also think it's important to acknowledge the magnitude of the past 24 hours with the reading of the verdict in the Chauvin murder trial and the mixture of emotions that yesterday and the past weeks have brought with it. Yesterday, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, along with many others, declined to call the, the verdict justice, but rather accountability as a step toward justice. He then went on to remind us that this step was built on the courage of bystanders including children who first stopped and raised their voices for George Floyd, not because they knew him, but the, because they saw his humanity. And I'd like to now shift our attention to our guest speaker today. I'm very excited to introduce Ifoma Ebo. Ifoma Ebo is an urban designer, architect, and strategist who transforms urban spaces into platforms for equity and design excellence. In her 20 year career, she has led projects in architecture, urban revitalization, community, large scale master planning, infrastructure upgrading, urban policy and neighborhood development. As the founding director of Creative Urban Alchemy LLC, she is a highly sought after consultant on equitable design and sustainable development strategy for city governments and civic institutions internationally. Through leadership roles in urban design and development initiatives funded by institutions and organizations such as the United Nations, FIFA, and the New York and NYC Mayor's Office, she's excelled in managing multidisciplinary teams towards the planning and implementation of projects supporting racial, social, and cultural equity. Ifoma is one of the founding members of the Black Space Urbanist Collective, a national network of Black planners, urbanists, architects, and creatives striving for equity and justice in the built environment. She also teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on urban design and equity at Columbia University and Syracuse University, and has delivered lectures and keynote addresses nationally and internationally. And last but not least, Ifoma holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master of City Planning from right here at MIT. Ifoma will talk for the next 45 minutes or so, followed by an open question and answer session. Everyone's welcome to post any comments or questions in the chat at any time, and then Ifoma will respond at the end. And for the purposes of saving bandwidth today, I'm gonna to ask everyone to turn off their video during the lecture. Um, so please now join me in extending a really warm welcome back to MIT to Ifoma Ebo. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Marie and um, Dust, for welcoming me. It's so um, such an honor to share my work with my alma mater <clears throat> and my thesis advisor from from um, MIT is present. <laughs> I feel like I'm winning today. Um, so let me share my screen. So um, it, I feel like the, the topic of this, the subject matter of this lecture is so appropriate right now coming off the heels of um, this verdict yesterday, still feeling very, you know, torn about everything that led up to yesterday. So I'm, I'm really quite excited to, um, to share this work that I've done over the course of my career, just some snippets of it. Um, again, the, the title is Landscapes of Contested Power. And 
I've just been on this journey of really um, trying to explore and understand power. Um, um, and really understand the, the how power, power is used, what's the definition of power, um, especially in this conversation around equity and justice in the built environment and how power plays a role in that. And, and so I, I went to this book that um, I purchased a long time ago, The Blueprint for Black Power, where Amos Wilson, he sort of breaks down different facets of, of, of power. And he talks about how it's just the, it's the essence of life. It's, it's the force that encourages growth and development. And, and it really is just the essence of just what allows people to adapt to their environment or even just create their environment or, or thrive. Um, but it is also, it has also been used as a, as a weapon. It's been weaponized from one group across against another um, and used to restrict the freedoms of, of groups or oppress groups, depress groups. Um, create segregation. Um, and I think it's very important to just understand that dynamic as when thinking about the built environment, when thinking about planning, architecture, landscape architect, whatever it is, that these disciplines have been used as a tool for, um, a, as a weapon for um, increasing power, diminishing power between um, social groups. And so I, I also think back to this keynote address in 1968 by Whitney M. Young, who is a civil rights activist. And he was invited to speak to the American Institute of Architects Convention in 1968. And this, this is during the civil rights movement, which if you don't know, you know, a huge part of the, the, the impetus for the civil rights movement was, was housing segregation and unequal um, and separate and unequal environments. The built environment was a huge impetus for the civil rights movement. And so he talks, he speaks to architects at that time. And, and essentially reprimands them. It says, you've been silent, you've been silent, you're thunderous silence, and you're complete irre irrelevant to this movement. Um, and really trying to push them to be more involved, to really think about how they've been complicit in creating the injustice in the built environment at the time. Um, he says, we didn't just suddenly get this situation, it was carefully planned. And um, I've returned to this, this quote because it's just, it feels like hauntingly that it's so very relevant today as we are experiencing, um, you know, the, the, the proliferation of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the protests and et cetera and so forth and just the injustice in built environment that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. It almost feels like we need to return to this keynote address because of the ways in which we are seeing the, how the built environment has been complicit in the inequities that we are seeing in, in communities of color. And so, you know, I think, I think emphatically we understand that white supremacy is, is, has been, is a spatial practice, something that we need to, to shift out of. But we know this because of just the legacy of tools that have been used, a legacy in ways that the architecture and planning has been used, whether it's through urban renewal, redlining, um, exclusionary zoning, et cetera, and so forth. The, the protection of whiteness, the safety of whiteness um, has encouraged the use of the built environment, land use, et cetera, and so forth as a way of subjugating one group against another. And, and, and wielding power and increasing power in the hands of some and um, decreasing power in the hands of others. And so I'll just go through just a few examples of that. And, you know, we see just in, in racial zoning ordinance in Baltimore and other cities that just how black spaces and black people have de been defined. And black spaces have been defined as places of slums, civil dis disturbance, disease, um, all in an effort to protect and elevate and amplify the white majority and protect the property values of, of the white majority. And you know, the redlining maps often are referred to as security maps as well. And there's sort of this, this, this relationship between white supremacy and, and the concept of safety and what safety actually means and who's safety and, and, and who is being protected. So we also see this in just the Excuse me. If 
policies. We also see this in just the the creation of the suburbs and the and the ways in which um, the uh, rate racial covenants and exclusionary zoning um, incorporated into the, the development of the suburbs in order to, to again, promote white supremacy and, and to um, ensure that whiteness is safe and secure. Um, and that's done through um, land use, excluding industrial and commercial developments, excluding low-income housing. So any, any group that is associated with living that or needs the low-income housing or um, works in commercial industry or in, in, in industry in general, in factories in general, do not exist in these spaces. Um, and then also in order to, to really solidify that, in, we have not only um, creates a model in, in time, but it also ensures that it's sustainable through generations, but with the with the intention of crippling the black community. And then we also have um, single family zoning that also, also has been used as a, as a weapon against the black community, ensuring that you don't have multifamily housing in certain areas with maximum density, using minimum lot sizes, like all of these spatially oriented tools to ensure that only one group is able to um, um, benefit from, from the tools and the way in which they are used in the development of land. And then we also see how urban planners and designers have been complicit in this, um, designating separate areas, withholding building permits, creating buffers to separate uh, residential areas between races. And what's so fascinating, I think, about this, and this is from a book, you know, just exploring city planning, displacement, zoning, race, displacement, and city planning in New York City, but that this is not only unique to New York, it's not only unique to the United States, it's also, I found myself working in South Africa, it's also, it's international. You know, the apartheid system in South Africa has also used these very same tools as a way of segregating and separating races and dividing people by class. Um, and we also see just in New York City with just the, the work of Robert Moses, who was the, um, the head of the parks and recreation and infrastructure um, during the 50s and the legacy that he's left through the use of uh, highways and freeways and, and um, just infrastructure in general to displace, demolish and completely economically disenfranchise black communities. And we, we know through history, we know through the, the research that um, this was his intention. His intention was to render communities of color just out of sight, out of mind, and, um, and impose upon them just a, a history of injustice. And these are just some images from Cape Town, South Africa, just in my experience of working there, you see that these are areas that they were created before apartheid ended in the 90s, but they still exist in the same conditions today, poor infrastructure, um, complete duality in terms of the environment of the inner city and the environment of the township communities. So we see that this is not, it's not just a local phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And, and that power relations, that they're really connected to property relations, that there's a, there's a, um, a, a very close relationship between the two. But we, I think, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel is that, and there's a really great quote from Mario Gooden, who's a professor at Columbia University. He wrote this book, Dark Space. And he says, liberation is a spatial practice. The same way that the same tools that have been used to disenfranchise Black communities can also be used to liberate. Um, and there's so much writing on this as well. You know, Bell Hooks is in, in, an author and, and she writes that freedom is also connected to the trans formation of space, that you can actually liberate and create spaces for freedom um, through, through design and planning the built environment. And, and Melvin Mitchell in his book, The Crisis of the African-American Architect, um, he was talking about the, um, the Harlem Renaissance and how artists, Black artists of that time, use art as a way of expressing Black culture and struggle. And he argues that architecture is also an appropriate media for doing that. And we're seeing that in, um, there's a new exhibition happening at the Museum of Modern Art right now called 
reconstructions, um, um, blackness and architecture, um, architecture and blackness in America. And there's a whole, the all of the artists in that in ex that exhibition, they are architects and they're actually using tools of architecture, um, but in a public art scale to really express the black culture and, and, and struggle as a way of really grappling with just like, how do we arrive at liberation? And so we see that where we've come from and how do we make sure that black liberation in particular exists in the future? And so I, I, I'm just gonna go through some of the work that I've been a part of in my career is just in an attempt to do that. And, and one that I'm, I feel most proud of is um, my role as one of the founding members of the Black Space Urbanist Collective. We are a national network. Um, we have affiliates um, in Atlanta, Chicago, Indianapolis, um, Oklahoma City, and growing. And we are based in our board, our national board is based in New York City. And we started in, in 2015 really um, wanting to, to just come together, create a space for Black planners to come together. I think um, there might be some familiar faces here. Uh, Kenyatta McLean right here. She is also one of the founding members of the Black Space Urbanist Collective and a graduate of DUSP. I think she just graduated last year. Um, and our vision is that we demand a present and future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture matter and thrive. And we do that through many different um, approaches and but at the center of our all of our work is the is the black public black spaces safe spaces for black people because we acknowledge that there's this history where whiteness has been elevated and amplified and we want to completely just work on this have this experience of unlearning because we also understand that the ways in which we've been trained as architects planners has been complicit in this in this narrative of white supremacy. And so we have to go through an experience of decolonizing our mind, unlearning, and, and really thinking about ways that black, the black publics can be amplified. And so we center the black publics in our work. We, um, we also, our work is in, in the form of customized learnings for different entities, published content, so writing articles, et cetera, and so forth, blogs. Um, neighborhood strategies, so working with communities to um, come up with new ideas and approaches to addressing cultural heritage um, in, in um, community development work, and also urbanist experiences, like working with other urbanists, particularly Black urbanists, and co-creating new ideas together. And um, again, I mentioned that we have a number of other affiliates. We have, you know, people in, we have groups in Chicago and and Oklahoma City and, and, and other cities and growing that are also interested in doing this work. And they're, they're having film, they're creating films, they're um, producing books, they're doing a number of different things as a way of amplifying the challenges and opportunities with the Black public. And then also within that, we have our different committees. We have content committee, the thought leadership committee, um, coming up with new tools and, and workshop tools, um, our managing members, our programming, our governance. So this is our structure. And it's not, in essence, this is Blackness in design. This is a way of, of working where um, you're focused on the collective as opposed to the amplification of an individual. And I mentioned before, we, we work very closely with our affiliates. We refer to them as our cousins um, in other cities. And we collaborate with them on published content and urbanist experiences that then feed into our quote unquote design firm that then where we produce neighborhood strategies and customized learning that then those products feed again into our published content. And so we, we operate in a very cyclical way. And our beginnings was just like this. Um, this is actually my living room. Um, we had brunches, we had get togethers where people where we would just come together and talk, we build, we talk about what are the challenges occurring in black communities, in the communities that we lived in and communities that we're working in. Um, and what are ways of working that um, have not been effective? What are ways that we've been trained that have not been effective in, in really supporting black communities in, in, in a dignified way. And, um, and, and these conversations led to the creation of um, the Black Space Urbanist Collective and, and also to us um, getting a grant in 2017 by the J.M. Kaplan Fund to do work in Brownsville. And Brownsville is a historic African-American community in New York. And we were really on this path towards exploring what are ways, what's a methodology of working um, towards community development that really strives to 
um, support communities in addressing cultural heritage conservation. And we wanted to focus on this in particular because of the, the, the narrative around gentrification and how it's displacing leaders and erasing culture. And we were thinking, what, are, what's, what is our entry point to that conversation around gentrification? And how can we really um, strengthen cultural cap capital to build agency and attachment in Brownsville? And so that work took many forms. And we sort of just like we're in this year long process of sort of stumbling and fumbling and really just like, how do we unlearn how we've been trained and, re and at the same time create a new method of working? So we did, we did a lot of mapping and we, ma we did mapping with young people, senior citizens, et cetera, and so to understand what are those safe spaces in their community? What are those cultural assets um, in the community where people have felt safe to be themselves, where they feel that their culture is promoted and cultivated? And who are those leaders? Who are the cultural producers? Who are the people that, that paint them? excuse me, paint the murals that produce the festivals um, in their community. And so we went to where people were. And we also made sure that the funds that we got from Jam Kaplan were distributed in the community to local businesses. So anytime we wanted to hire a photographer or a documentary or um, someone to, to serve food or anything, we made sure that we supported local businesses and a significant portion of our funds went to local businesses. And this was also a part of our model of just how power can be shifted, how ways of working that is not only about the final product, it's also about the process and also about who you're bringing and who you're partnering with, who are you hiring and procuring in your process of working and that, and, and if we all collectively do that, um, this will begin to shift the needle and, 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 sh and, and really shift power. And so we also sort of try to document what are ways that heritage is conserved at this thing in, in, in Brownsville. And we, we saw that there were murals, there were writing circles, there were, um, they, were, they were naming streets and buildings after, after important people, black people in the community. And so just by acknowledging all of this, we also began to come up with a series of principles that we felt that we wanted to, to stand by, the things that will hold us accountable in our work. And that, and this was our part of our unlearning, um, the ways in which we've been trained to operate. And so, you know, this one example is moving at the speed of trust. You know, we, we're trained that, you know, you have to sort of like, you have your, your plan, you have to move your plan, you have a pro end product and you get, you get that product and you move on to the next project. But we wanted to sort of like stand in a place where and understand that you need to move at the speed of trust, move at the speed of which trust the people that you're working with trust the process and trust you to be doing that work and trust that you are listening authentically to them. And so our process was very cyclical. We would reflect and develop ideas, work with communities to co-create and link connections between ideas listen intently and, and humbly, and then feed all of that back into a reflection and co-development again. And so we continuously have this process. And it's only in hindsight that we could have come, come up with this pinwheel because at, in, the, in the midst of the process, we were really just in exploration mode. And what came out of that process was really a number of different ideas that we co-created with community around um, transforming public space around prototyping and activating black space and learning by doing in partnership with young people and, and old people. And, and, but also I think what the, the largest thing that came out of that process was our black space manifesto. And again, it was the born out of just like this process of just like holding ourselves accountable. And it was really supposed to be for us, for us to um, in our work moving forward these would be 14 key principles that we would make sure um, is, is emphasized in all the work that we do, whether it's in our operations or, the, or our, the projects that we work on, the consulting that we do, the public speaking that we do, that we would make sure that these principles are really at the foundation of, of our work. And they're really born out of understanding this legacy and this history of injustice in the built environment and the impacts of urban renewal and redlining that have had on Black communities, um, and that these principles were really in response to that. You know, for example, reckoning with the past to build the future, that in every project we work on, we want to understand what are those histories, injustice, and innovation, and victories of spaces and places before new work, work begins. And also understanding that 
you know, these tools have been used to financially cripple Black communities. And so cultivating wealth needs to be at the foreground of all the work that we do. And wealth is not only about financial wealth, it's also about time, talent, and treasure in a community. What are those seeds that just need nourishing in order to grow? And so you can find this, uh, these, this manifesto on blackspace.org. Um, and as well as other work that we've done. And, and so I love this quote by Lene Denise, where um, she talked about, you know, really to, in order to really transform this society, justice needs to be a pleasurable experience. And I think this is so critical, particularly for built environment practitioners, because we are in this work of future making. You know, our work, architects, landscape architects, planners, our work is not for today. It's not even for tomorrow. It's for years down the line. And we also create the visualizations of what that's going to look like. And so we need to make, we need to think about justice at the forefront of that future making, but then also think about how it can be pleasurable for every, you know, like how it can be look like a pleasurable experience. And I think this image here, by Olale Kanjeofus. He's actually one of the artists in the exhib exhibition at MoMA that I mentioned. I went to architecture school with him. He creates this, um, this beautiful visual of just four men, you know, walking confidently um, with so much swag on the street. And, you know, in today, this image, if you see it in reality, people, some may be frightened by this image. Some may be may think that um, you know, th this is a criminal act, but if you project it into the future and we all think about it differently, that it can be a pleasurable experience. It can be seen as something that's so beautiful as four Black men confidently walking on the street. And this in itself is, is, is justice. And so I want to go to some work I did um, in, in, on the African continent. I spent five years working in, in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and my first year working there, I worked for Architecture for Humanity, which is a nonprofit organization that's no longer in existence. But um, at the time, they were really focused on using architecture and design as, as a tool for um, community development um, and for really striving to, to support communities that have not experienced design excellence or good design. And so the aim of this, the program was called the Football for Hope Centers. And it was right after the, the World Cup had landed in Africa for the first time in South Africa um, and in 2010. And so I, was, I, I moved to, to South Africa in, in 2010. And the aim of these quote unquote Football for Hope Centers was to bring necessary resources to the most under-resourced communities in each African city that hosted a facility. And so there were 20, African cities across the continent that hosted one of these facilities. And so what you're seeing here are all the, 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 the 20 different facilities that were built across the continent. And um, the center was each center was composed of one building and a soccer pitch, simple in, composi in composition, but impactful in their design and transformation of underutilized and often unsafe spaces in active places that bring the community together. And so um, this one center, this, this center is in Mali, and it's centered on traditional Malian design and construction methods. And it really served to be, to use architecture as a repository of, of um, African culture and history. And I think this is so important, particularly on the continent that has been colonized. Um, colonial architecture, you know, here, there, and everywhere. But this was a, a, an act of really digging into what are the traditional methods of architecture and how can that be amplified so that people understand where they come from through their built environment. And that was really centralized in, in, in this architectural um, concept here. And then um, this is the facility in Cape Town, South Africa, in Kailicha, which is a township community at the, at the edges of Cape Town. You know, these are the communities that were created during apartheid in order to um, create environments for Black South Africans to live in. And so, and even today, more than 20 years post-apartheid, they still exist without running water or electricity, et cetera, and so forth. So all the more important for a center like this to be present great places of, of Black joy, um, and particularly in a, in a township community. And so this particular center, center uses football-based programs to educate young people 
on HIV AIDS awareness and prevention. In one of the toughest under resourced communities in Cape Town, the center transformed this unsafe um, uh, area into an opportunity for the cultivation of new skills and abundant joy. And so this the space that you see on the right hand side where the soccer pitch is located used to be just like a, a vacant area where, where women were raped, where there was a lot of criminal activity. And so what this the introduction of the Football for Hope Center did here was it really activated the space in a way that it eliminated those opportunities for criminal activity to, to occur. So it really was about protecting safety for this the, the black community that, that lived there in a way that was that amplified um, um, joy and, and really created a dignified space. Um, the center in Ghana was created to integrate education into health, social, and football programs to promote leadership and soci sociology economic development, particularly in Ghana. And very similarly, these are areas that are under-resourced, you know, perhaps even don't have infrastructure. And so even just um, creating an opportunity for infrastructure to exist here provides infrastructure for the surrounding community or village or, or the, the, the area immediately around it. So the, the, the centers themselves not only um, supported that the, the actual center, the, you know, the infrastructure not only supported the actual center, but also supported the community surrounding the center. Um, and the, the design of the facility also distinguishes itself by the use of local building materials centering texture and pattern as a focal point for the design. So again, you, the use of traditional building methods and really amplifying the ways in which culture um, exists in, in architecture in, in place. And so I love this, again, a quote by Adrienne Marie Brown in her book, um, Emergent Strategy, where she says that we, ima we must imagine new wor worlds where Black and brown people are not seen as terrorists and aliens, but cultural and economic innovators. Again, you know, as we are future makers and future thinkers, you know, really um, shepherding a process of dreaming and imagining in the future, we must do this work collaboratively with people who have been um, who have been excluded from that process in the past, who have been marginalized and disenfranchised in the past. We must collaborate with them in dreaming or create spaces for dreaming. Um, so that you, and, and also in the ways in which we visualize that future, we need to think about the ways, the injustice of the present and how that we can turn a corner in that. And it's a it's a really a time travel experience. Every time we, we create a, a master plan, we create a community vision, it's a time travel experience. We're sort of projecting into the future, the, the present that we want to see. And so um, I also spent three years working for the mayor's office of criminal justice in New York City, working specifically for the, on the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safe, safety. And we, we focused on 15 public housing developments across the city. And the, the sort of the narrative around the, these developments was that they were the high crime um, communities in New York City. And not to say that crime was rampant across New York City, but this was really a theme, I would say, of this legacy of redlining and urban renewal and disenfranchisement, the stain of all that legacy of injustice in the built environment. The stain of it is that these communities are, are experiencing high crime. And but the thing is that the, the narrative around the communities don't, does not does not um, it does not embody that story around injustice in the built environment. It just embodies the story about crime. And it also embodies the story that these these communities have been experienced overcrowded high housing, high poverty rates, unemployment, you know, adults without high school equivalents, like all of these are residue of this injustice in the past. And again, the, you know, the areas that have been highest impact, highest impacted, highest impact by the pandemic are the same communities that are, have experienced this hardship index and are experiencing high crime. And so, but people, the, the people that live there are often blamed for the fact that there's crime there. And so we have, you know, the advent of uh, these tools like crime prevention through environmental design in the 70s by Oscar Newman, 
you know, we have these tools that have been created in the past and they've been used and they've been recycled um, as tools for addressing crime, but really at the, the, the heart of those tools has been, you know, creating environments that um, are almost like jails for communities of color that really weaponize tools like um, um, cameras and, and lighting and fencing and, and weaponize them against communities of color. So they are living environments that feel like jails, that feel like prisons, um, all in an effort, again, to protect whiteness, to ensure that whiteness is safe. And so the, you know, this, my three years working, I really grappled with just this understanding that really I was learning and growing into this understanding through the three years of working there because I was seeing the ways in which um, these tools of SEPTED were really being weaponized against the, the, the 15 communities that I interacted with, going there in the daytime and the nighttime, listening to stories, listening to trauma. And, you know, these two maps are an example of just like what that trauma looks like. On the, the map on the left, you have, you know, the, the, these are youth crews or gang maps. Each of those colors represent a different gang. Um, and this is what people actually experience on the ground. You know, I wouldn't know where these gang lines exist if I didn't see this map, but when I go to the community, I don't know this story, but the people that live there, they know these invisible safety, community safety issues. They, they understand where the lines are drawn and it impacts the way in which they navigate their community. And on the, the map on the right, you see is a New York City crime map from the um, NYPD um, uh, crime website. Um, and every time a 911 call is made, one of these circles shows up on the community and on the, on, the, on the map. So every one of these circles represents a different criminal activity that occurred. And so again, if I go to that neighborhood, I don't know these stories and narratives, but the people that live there understand them. All the more important for involving people in the process of understanding and defining what safety means and what unsafety means and what are the ways to address those challenges. Um, and so we, we have this um, initiative called Neighborhood Activation, it was a study exploring how design can be used as a way of addressing criminal um, crime prevention in communities and really sort of turning the corner from focusing on SEPTED um, to really thinking a bit holistically about what are those root issues associated with crime? Like why is a crime occurring in the communities? How do we reckon with this past in order to build the future? Um, and, and use design to address those injustices of the past. And so we were sort of exploring, you know, innovative ways of lighting the night can invite activity, you know, ways of amplifying entrepreneurship and supporting jobs growth through the transformation of public space, you know, in, encouraging more greening of the environment as a way of addressing anxiety and, 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 and just um, depression in the community. So really we wanted to, to not just deal with like, oh, that gun was shot. How do you uh, prevent more guns, you know, from more people from shooting guns or taking drugs um, in the community or selling drugs in the community, but really what are those underlying issues? Why are people going into a life of crime and how can you address that at its root? And so, you know, went through this engagement process, we, we understood these six different facets of the, the cultural challenges in the community, because it's, it's a cultural issue, crime is a cultural issue. Um, and, and so what came from the community was that there was, there, were, there was a lack of opportunities for health and wellness, youth engagement, culture and community, et cetera, and so forth. But then also, these are also opportunities for creating a safe space, safe space for the people that live there and, and defined in the way that they want it to be defined in terms of their own ideas around safety. And so an example is, if you start with a, a center that uh, maybe has youth engagement, health and wellness, um, culture and community, and but it doesn't fully complete that circle. And through design and, and programming, you can actually complete that circle by providing opportunities for um, entrepreneurship, violence prevention, and that in itself creates a safe space. It creates a safe space for the people that have been um, that have been not been accounted for in, in thinking about safety in the past. And so if you think about, you know, the, the network of spaces and assets in the community, whether they be libraries, public housing, a cafe, a barber shop, that you can complete the circle in each of those spaces, either through design of the built environment 
or through programming of those spaces. And you can begin to connect people through programs and partnerships. And that in effect is activating the neighborhood. And that these tools that, that, that city governments can also have, they also empowered to use the public realm around their public assets of firehouses or police stations or libraries, use the public realm as a way of activating um, programming in the community, but then also um, supporting safe routes through the community as well. And so this can also spur opportunities for entrepreneurship and gathering um, and, and, and supporting health, health and wellness. But it's not only the assets and the places, but it's also the routes that get there and what are ways that our streets can be activated in the same way that we're thinking about activating our key assets in a community through arts, lighting, um, street elements, et cetera, and so forth. So this is an example. This is in Brownsville, again, the, the historic African-American community in, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, this is the Brownsville Library. You see that there's fencing all around it, which for me says this place is not safe. If my own library has a fence around it, it's telling me that this is Fort Knox, Something is gonna happen here, which is why there's a fence around this space. Like it's barricaded on all sides. And, and, it's, and this is a library embedded in a public housing development. And so the, 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 the message that this building is sending to people is that you do not live in a safe environment, that, that, that crime can just pop off at any point in time. And it's not really fostering an environment of people feeling secure and safe. And, and the library, particularly in this community is so critically important for residents in that this is a place, sometimes it's the daycare center, sometimes it's the after school program. You know, sometimes people in the summer, they just have to leave their children at the library and go to work because they cannot afford to leave them anywhere else. And so the library really serves as a, a critical asset in the community and, and really needs to be thought differently. And so through the work of Studio Gang, which is a firm that we worked partnered with on this neighborhood activation study, we rethought the ways in which um, our assets can be transformed through transforming of the public realm immediately surrounding them and really opening it up opportunity and really transforming the way people think about public assets and inevitably, hopefully, the way they think about government and really as an effort to build trust between community and government and using the, the facilities, the, the government assets in a community as a way of transforming thinking about government. And so that this process really involved meeting people where they were, engaging the real experts, residents, and understanding what are the key assets that should be transformed, how should they be transformed, what other um, uses are best for, for these places, these spaces. And one of the ways that we did that was really, um, and this is now focused on public housing, we, we did mapping with residents to help them understand what, what, what mapping is. Um, and we worked with the Center for Court Innovation that has a number of community justice centers throughout the city of New York and, and partnered with them to take residents through a training program over the course of a year and helping them understand human centered design, community organizing, fundraising, just building their capacity. So after our program was completed, they are fully capable of moving forward on any type of work and projects that they wanted to, to implement in the public realm. And so this mapping was really helping us to understand, helping them to understand what mapping is, but then also us to understand what are those um, undesirable activities that residents are seeing and experiencing in their development. And you can see the colors represent the different activities from public urination to substance sale, but then also exploring what are those positive activities? Where are young people hanging out? Where are senior citizens hanging out? And how, and how can we really think about ways that this positive activity can shift to un the, the places where undesirable activity is occurring. And this is where undesirable activity is occurring. There are these like really broad sidewalks without any seating or any active use on them. You have plenty of trash just piled up in different locations. You have cracked sidewalks and poor lighting. Like these are just environments you just do not want to be in, in the day or in the nighttime. And this is a legacy of just like this injustice in the built environment, the marginalization of these communities and just the lack of funding and support to upkeep these areas and, and, and create dignified environments.
for people. And so when people don't use these spaces, then you have just them taken over by undesirable activity. And so, you know, we understand that, you know, power is a chameleon that you can use um, it takes on the texture of an environment. And so you can use the built environment as a way of shifting power from the hands from one group to another. And really the work that we did around transforming the public realm was thinking about how we can use the process of transforming public spaces to shift power, to make, to allow people to feel like they are, they have power over their environments, that they can transform their environments, that um, they can um, actually get a yes when they've all the time they've been getting no's, whether things from like make putting a garden or painting a mural, but they can feel empowered through that process and also get the resources that they need to use that power into the future. And so this is an example in the Bronx. This is Patterson Houses um, in the Bronx. And this is you know another community that has been formerly redlined, experienced the legacy of injustice. And you see that there's fencing around this green space. And it's just like, why? Why is there fencing around a green space? If the green spaces are the area of the places where we're supposed to connect with nature and, you know, and nature is supposed to be a, a, a way for us to, you know, relieve anxiety and deal with mental health um, and, 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 and really come together for the community. And then so when you're, your open space is fenced in like that, what does that mean for your community? What does that say? To you um, that you don't you don't deserve to to connect with nature in this way, and and so the the resident team at Patterson Houses they really wanted to tackle this space and also in particular because it was an area where people were um, abusing um, substances they would take you know use and then drop their needles in this in this area so they really wanted to use this space as a way of addressing mental health issues and substance abuse. And so this rendering that was created was really just to, to come bring together some ideas of just like, what are they thinking about? What, how do they want this space to really center um, uh, peace and serenity? And, and, and what are the elements that are going to be in that space, the features? And also, who do they want to, the, who, do, who do they want to partner with in the creation of this space? And, and and it was a really beautiful outcome that as a result, the, the people that you see in the black shirts are the residents of Patterson Houses. Um, you see also some members from Citibank. You see some members from an organization called Mission Continues. And they all came together to support the, the residents in implementing this Serenity Garden. And, and what's beautiful about this image is that these, this represents connections and, and support and, and, and resources that the residents can use into the future if they want to transform other spaces in their community. And this is what it means to use public spaces, urban spaces as a, as a way of amplifying equity and justice and really shifting power. You know, now they are empowered with partnerships. They are empowered with a space where they can do new programming to really then grapple with the underlying issue in their community that has resulted in crime, which is the, the, the use, the um, substance abuse. And so you can see that they've now termed it the Serenity Garden. The gate is open for anyone to open and come into that space. They have Tai Chi classes, Zumba classes, et cetera, and so forth in an effort to really um, grapple with the challenge that they're seeing in their community. This is another space in Staten Island, the Stapleton Houses, the tennis court. You can see tennis is not a sport of choice. In this particular community is a whole pile of garbage in the, in the corner. This is also a space that residents have expressed where use is used as, uh, for substance abuse. And so they really wanted to think of, think differently about this space, activate it in a different way to get the community out and bring resources to the community that are much needed. And so their idea was to work with an artist to create these kiosks that then can be wheeled out. They can bring other nonprofit or government agencies to come out and bring resources and, and um, information to the community about healthy eating, um, about nutrition, about substance abuse, mental health, uh, therapy, et cetera, and so forth. And they did just that. The resident team came together, they found an artist, they worked with the, the Staten Island Community Justice Center to really create this environment. And so every time they wanna have a market or a resource hub day, they wheel out these um, kiosks and they bring in nonprofit organizations and government agencies to bring the resources. And again, every time they, they have different organizations come out 
to provide resources and support and information, that's another opportunity for partnership. That's a, 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 another opportunity for shifting power for the residents in this particular community. Um, and then finally, this is another example by um, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, again, um, the resident team, they wanted to transform this Dr. Green playground, which has been associated with substance abuse, people dumping trash on it, just, and also young black men feeling afraid or just black youth feeling afraid to go into this park because they could be accosted and harassed by police. And so they wanted to think differently about lighting in this space and not just like what, what we see in New York has been these really, these floodlights, these blinding floodlights that are really loud because they have generators. And this is just, you know, born out of the legacy of using stepped as an approach to addressing crime, but really not thinking creatively about how people can be a part of new solutions. Um, and so what they thought about here was having a night party where they had a lit up stage, they had, everybody had a headphones because in this particular park after 10 p.m. you cannot have music past 10 p.m. So they, the creative way that they addressed this was having two DJs, headphones, you can listen to one DJ or another, and there were just like hundreds of children out there enjoying themselves. And this was just a, a, an amazing display of um, catalyzing Black joy and really creating a culture um, around this, this space of positive memories. So, so the more they have these types of activities, the, the more positive memories they have associated with the space and, and less opportunity there is for, for criminal activity to occur in the space when you have so much positive activity occurring in the space. So I wanna end with um, this really wonderful framework um, by Seth Alo, who's an environmental psychologist. And I use this often in my work. It's, um, it's, a, it's the, she refers to them as the, the domains of justice. And um, I think I felt I found that this has really been um, not aside from the Black Space Manifesto. I found that this has really been a great framework for me in, in urban design and thinking about the transformation of public and urban spaces. But the first is like it's distributive that you need to think about um, in, ensuring that good design, good planning is done in places that need it most. And we know from this legacy and this history of in, of injustice where those places are. Um, procedural, that in order to have a just process, you need to make sure that people are involved in that process. You're centering the lived experience of residents. Interactional, that the process in itself and the final product encourages people to feel welcome and wanted in that space. Um, and then also representational, that, the, that there's an acknowledgement of the history and culture of that community and that the culture is also inspiration for new ideas. And also the actual representate, it's actually represented in imagery in the space. And also finally, just ethic of care, that you're encouraging people to care for one another through the process of making and creating, but then also in the final product and caring for that space and, and caring for one another. So um, thank you again so much for this opportunity for me to share. And I'm really excited to hear um, some of the questions and thoughts and, and what resonated for you. Thank you so much, Ifoma. Um, I would like to invite people to, to turn on their cameras if they want to right now um, as we get into a, a discussion. We'll see how it goes with our, our connection here. But um, please, if you feel comfortable, turn on your camera. And I invite you to ask questions or um, reflect on the on the really amazing lecture. Hi, Bomi. <laughs> I think we have another dust balloon. Hello. Uh, uh, hi, that was amazing. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Me and Bomi graduated at the same time. Hi, can I raise a comment and a question? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm, I'm Louise Elving, I'm a dust alum, but from a long, long time ago, and I now teach in the Spurs program in dust. Um, so that was a wonderful presentation. And I really appreciated your combination of talking to us both about general issues and understanding issues of how do you understand justice, how do you understand spatial justice, and also telling us about specific projects you did. 
because that's a great combination. I think if planning can do that, it's one of its strengths. One of the questions I wanted to ask you about was the question of political action in relation to the, the whole framework for working with and helping communities get control of space and place and their own planning. Because so often this means you need to move public authorities, if it's the housing authority or the city or the state to get money or get permission or to get them to back off of policing or some of those bad kinds of, of punitive interventions you were talking about, like from security cameras to fencing to where they put streets. So I guess I would like to ask if you could talk some about kind of what you see as what I'm calling the political dimension, meaning outside the important political organizing um, and humanitarian organizing of the communities themselves. No, absolutely, and um, and I'm glad you asked that question because it, uh, you know we straddled that line um, when working in the mayor's office of, of criminal justice. You know, the work that I did uh, leading um, the strategic design work was within a broader uh, program as a part of the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety. And a lot of that work was really bringing together leadership from different agencies that have been complicit in that the legacy in the community. So we had to bring together not only the New York City Housing Authority, but also the Department of Sanitation, um, Department of Parks and Recreation, NYPD, you know, definitely. Um, and so the, the process around the work that you saw was really a lot of convening, a lot of things talking about really having residents define what the problem is. So we worked with them to create these policy documents. And so where they define what are the issues that they're seeing on the ground. And then they were able to present those issues to leadership in these different agencies. And then we used our power in the mayor's office to really encourage the agencies to, to, um, to, to respond, you know, what, what now? What are you going to do? What, what new policies are you going to form? What new ways of operating are you going to create to address this very relevant um, issue that you're hearing right now? And so that was sort of a way that we were, I, I, I'm hoping that this is answering your question, but that was a way we were sort of like really dealing with the other side. So it wasn't only about like resident energy and where they're transforming spaces, but are really at another level these ideas that they were that residents were creating in public space were to be a model and pilot, and and really um, offer a solution for addressing crime in the community, for addressing um, you know um, uh, uh, a poor built environment or the quality of a built environment that then agencies should be able to pick up. Like after seeing a program in public space with the Brownsville, um, the way they lit up the, the stage at night, like the Department of Parks and Recreation should have plenty of solutions now. Like when they're thinking about how do we transform our, par our parks at night? Like, boom, you have an idea right there, right? So the, there, there isn't uh, a, a space where there, there people don't have ideas because we, we, we spent oh, three years generating ideas across 15 public housing developments on, on ways to transform public space, but then also, we, we held agencies accountable to their, um, the ways in which they've been complicit in creating the environments that we see today. Can I ask a related question to that? I mean, um, yeah. so for folks who don't know me, I am ex NYCHA as of Friday. Um, <laughs> so I feel free to ask a little bit of a, maybe a little bit polemical question. Um, so, you know, in New York, we have, uh, you know, a history of, um, policy discontinuity when we have leadership changes, whether it's at the agency level or whether it's in, you know, at, the, at the citywide uh, elected officials level. We have one of those moments coming up soon. And I was just wondering if Oma, you know, I, I'm, uh, how, well, I'm a little worried that some of these, um, these the, some of the progress that's been made under this administration may not be sticky, right? So whether it's the work that you did or whether it's the work that Delma Palma has been leading within NYCHA for Connected Communities. There's been a lot of really great work that was really founded and grounded in, um, in really a different kind of rich engagement with residents. Uh, what recommendations would you have or thoughts do you have about 
how to make that kind of thing sticky through some of these political transitions that we know are coming up. I think developing a, a neighborhood fund specifically for a neighborhood activation fund, specifically for this type of work. Um, that's something that was I was trying to get put in place before I left the mayor's office, but wasn't successful in doing. But they're really just the same way that there is a neighborhood development fund associated with rezoning. There needs to be a neighborhood activation fund associated with just addressing roughly with the injustice in the built environment um, in these in these places and spaces. And that neighborhood development fund doesn't go away when there's a transition of, of power in New York City. It's, it's there and it's there to stay and you know, it's sort of managed by the Department of City Planning. Like, why couldn't be, there be something like that that just stays in place? That you, you, you create this fund that then gets replenished uh, every year. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? That's a, I mean, that's a really cool, cool idea. I mean, my, my, I was thinking back to, um, and it, it, I was just thinking back to maybe 197A plans need to get their teeth back, right? Um, you know, I did a, I, I was, 197A planning in New York is, is um, we have a, it, it is an alternative to our normal land use of, um, public approvals process called ULERP. Um, 197A, 197A plans are, at this point, they've been abandoned because um, at some point, city planning decided that they were non-binding advisory plans, right? So is there, is there a way to get real community planning their teeth, you know? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, and there needs to be appropriate funding um, dedicated to it. I mean, the same way that they have a significant uh, budget for building new jails, they need to have a significant budget for, for this type of work. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? I have some questions, but I'll, I'll see if anyone else. I just asked one follow-up. So what kind of activism or, or coming together or push do you think might help create that kind of funding, make the political sector and the people with the money decide they should really invest in these critical efforts and changes long-term? Um, I almost feel like it needs to, to be, it needs to come from residents, like the tenant association groups, like they need to, because this is, the, this is really, it's not, it's not anything that's been innovatively created by uh, the mayor's office. These are, this is work that residents have been trying to do in their community, but they kept getting no. Um, and this is what they expressed to us. But what we were able to do was wield power um, in order to get, get things moving. Um, and create a, a framework that allowed residents to be able to implement work that they'd always wanted to implement, but then have funding and resources and support to do that. And so um, I, I really think that it, it needs to come from both ends. It needs to come from residents really being empowered to, to come together. Like the tenant associations are really quite powerful um, in each of the developments. And um, I think there needs to be a space where they can all come together and, and make a noise. Um, and then also from just like agency representatives pushing whatever lever is necessary to make that happen. Um, I unfortunately was not in a position where I could pull levers um, at the time, but there are people who can. It's just a matter of what, whether they're willing to do that. I guess I wanted to ask a couple of, of questions about, and I think this is coming up a little bit in, in some of what others have, have talked about, but um, you know, you 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 mentioned um, SEPTED as a really problematic um, sort of policy of design that many um, many institutions lean on when speaking about crime. And um, it seems that some of the, the kind of uh, highest challenges that might come from the work with the, um, you know, developing the mayor's action plan for public safety is, is actually dealing with, um, you know, the, the city institutions and, and 
you know, when questions of crime and, and safety come up, there's the conversation gets sort of non-negotiable, it seems. And I, I guess I, I'm curious, like, if you could speak about um, what some of those conversations look like in trying to um, find alternative ways of, of dealing with issues that are connected with crime, but not relying on these methods that, that kind of just tend to reinforce the same negative outcomes. Um, it wasn't easy. I, I can tell you that. Um, when I started working at the mayor's office, um, I was I was thrust into a role where I was leading the actual mm -hmm. implementation of putting in cameras, doors, and, and gates, and all those things. Like I was thrust into leading that, and I and and I was still sort of just like I'm trying to understand what they were because you do have mixed feedback from residents. You do have people mm -hmm. saying, "Yes, yeah. I love that, please." But this is coming from people who have experienced a loss. Like they haven't gotten anything for so long. So it's just like, whatever you're gonna give me, just yes, give it to me. I, I want it, like give it to bring it to my development. Right. But without having an appropriate alternative, um, people are saying that this is what they want. And so what we were also seeing is that Septed was being was being implemented in ways that was um that was um very negative like it was very um i would say just not done with quality and dignity and so you had these floodlights i don't know if you've ever seen them but they're these really bright floodlights they have engines and so you hear very loud mm -hmm. burn, mm -hmm. right so there's air pollution there there's mm -hmm. air pollution there you know like they they did all these studies to to determine whether they have an impact on crime and okay, yes, they were decreasing crime, but then they were also decreasing just like all activity because mm -hmm. nobody wanted, you, you don't want to sit around those things, mm -hmm. okay, right? You can't even hear yourself think. If someone yelled next to that thing, you wouldn't be able to hear them yell. And so it was just like, um, I was experiencing seeing the ways in which SEPTED was really weaponized in the community. And I, and I was really trying to use my voice to push back on it because we were at a point where, um, you know, all of these floodlights had been put into a community. They did this study to see whether they were effective or not. Mm -hmm. And they had the floodlights there for six months in a community that didn't have really any lighting. Um, and then they just wanted to take it away. All the studies done, let's, let's take it out, we're finished. You're not gonna replace this with anything? No, do not take it away. This is the kind of feedback that we were getting. Um, and so my thought is there has to be another solution to just leaving floodlights there. And so the solution that we inevitably came up with through more research was let us repair the existing lights that are there um, because the existing infrastructure hadn't been repaired in so long. Mm -hmm. And so we just took a little bit more time, a little bit more money um, to just repair the existing lights in a way that was more dignified than having these floodlights. But that, that really was, it wasn't easy. Like I had to do a lot of heavy lifting and put, <laughs> sometimes shouting in order for people to just like see. And I think it's the, the challenge there is that people are not seeing people. They're not mm -hmm. seeing people, they're just seeing problems. They're just seeing crime and they're not seeing like individuals, like a grandmother, a mom, a, mm -hmm. a child walking through the, they're not seeing that. They're just seeing, we need to get rid of the crime but not, not thinking about this, these are need to be living quality environments mm -hmm. for, for people. And so um, I, I was really, um, uh, I think sometimes I'm still in a state of shock of how much I had to yell and come, just like mm -hmm. I had to be outside of myself um, and, and really push for things to be done in a dignified way. And I had to really, but, you know, even my supervisor had to confront the person and put this in your own backyard. If you're not going to put this in your own backyard, why are you going to put this in, in somebody else's backyard? Like, let's really just come down to earth and really. And the thing is that when it's a, a, a decision is made at that level, it's done across 300 public housing developments mm -hmm. across one, right? So this is multiple communities, thousands of people that are impacted. And I just, I really felt the weight. Mm -hmm. of, of that um and yeah i gotta say that it, it wasn't easy but we all need to do that and I mean, frustrated by the fact that i was the only one that was doing that 
I just I, I just want to shout out if I'm how like how, how I, that just speak what you're just saying right now speaks to me so much right because I was looking at this whole process from the other side of the aisle from within NYCHA and I have to tell you that um, the solutions that you know we were pushed to to go with were were not the solutions that even NYCHA's own capital team wanted right like NYCHA has a really pretty well designed park lighting system that, you know, whenever NYCHA has the opportunity to roll it out, our preferred, you know, NYCHA's preferred solution is to do our full, you know, integrated park lighting system where all of the, you know, like we, we use lights that are like highway lights mm -hmm. bolted to that. I don't know if any of your photos earlier showed that, Ifoma, but but those cobra headlights that are bolted mm -hmm. to the sides of the buildings, I mean, you know, among the things that really communicate disrespect, I think is, mm -hmm. you know, that really, you really, <laughs> that's really up there. Like we just took whatever piece of equipment and just bolted it onto the side, like something that you would never do in any kind of market rate housing. And so, so you know, that is, it, it, I, I just really want to appreciate um, how much uphill battle, uh, how much uphill, you know, advocacy you, you know, you have to do and sort of, you know, confirm that from the other side also that even with, you know, the, 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 um, the desires uh, within the agency to do the work the right way and even having a roadmap of how we thought we could do their work the right way, there was, there's always still this battle to try to, to do what Ifoma is talking about, which is to see beyond the immediate, you know, political expediency, see beyond the immediate funding cycle to say, well, what is the project that's really going to be impactful? So thank you so much for that, Ifoma. I just, I can't even imagine how frustrating that must be. Yeah. That's my problem. I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons it's so, um, I think it's really you know, powerful to to kind of situate your work in in saying that you're bringing um, design excellence to places that may not have experienced design excellence, and like, what are the the kinds of messages that come from, you know, high pressure sodium flood lighting and and highway lighting in in spaces that are supposed to be people's homes, and how hard it is to kind of um, open up conversations about that when you when when you know, the, the kind of questions of risk and liability so much come into the conversation really tend to shut down any questions about design. So I think being able to pull design into that conversation is, is you know, an extremely challenging um, thing to do. I, I guess I'm yeah. oh, sorry, go and ahead. I also, I also just want to sort of emphasize the point that like my, myself as a, as a black woman, as a black professional and the ways in which I'm perceived in a professional environment and the ways in which my voice is listened to or not listened to. I'm pretty sure if I was white in the same scenario, I wouldn't have had to push as much, mm -hmm. would have been received in a, in a very different way. And I think that is a part of the frustration as well. Because mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I'm humanizing the, the people that live in the environments because it, that could be, that could have been me. Mm -hmm. And my mom living, that could have been our legacy living in public housing. And so I see the, 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 uh, a, a, an alternate path that my life could have been on and it could be me. And I would have wanted someone to be a champion for me mm -hmm. in, that in that scenario. Um, and, and so it's, it really, um, it was tough. It was tough to not only speak up for the people that didn't have a voice in that scenario, but also the black woman just not wanting to be, per to be perceived as the angry black woman. Mm -hmm in that scenario, but then feeling angry <laughs> because, you know, the, the ways in which the, you know, the built environment has been, is being weaponized and I'm mm -hmm. seeing it, right, in real life, um, in real time. And so um, that I think also just made the whole scenario very complex as well. And I also feel that for my, my other colleagues who are also black women in this work, also feeling that frustration and that tug of war, of being on one side, right? Being seen by um, the community as, um, as a partner, as an ally, mm -hmm. color, right? And also being put in that position for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, but then also being responsible for implementing work or projects or products that are not good for the community, I do not do things in a dignified way and feeling that frustration around that. Um, it was a tough, um, I would say that was one of the toughest jobs I've had to, 
to take on dealing with that tug of war. We have time for a few more um, questions or reflections if anyone else here wants to, to say something. I'll jump in just for a second again, because I have a lot of <laughs> things that I've been thinking about. But, um, uh, you know, Ifoma, you, um, you know, you talked about or you, your, your kind of training is as an architect and a planner. And um, because there's a lot of, of um, students or early career um, professionals in this group, you know, you come out of, of um, out of school with your training and there's there's always a lot of, of ideas of how to kind of implement projects and and um, and I guess I'm curious like what are the kinds of skills that you were drawing upon um, when you were put into these positions where you're kind of um, negotiating on many sides to kind of move a project forward um, with with the example you were kind of just talking about here uh, what are the what was it what were the types of experiences that kind of prepared you for that um, I would say all of the above. I think definitely my planning education and just understanding the, the dynamic forces that impact um, urban development. Um, and also, I think, you know, what I remember from studying at, at MIT in particular was just, um, I took a lot of courses in HCED and in CDD. I was, I was in CDD. Um, and really just like understanding the, the connections between the two, how housing, community, and economic development also just like impacts the ways in which urban form is shaped. Um, and, and also just social justice and how, you know, that's one of the ethos of planning. And, and, um, and, and I think that accompanied my architectural um, understanding and learning and, and transformed it in, in major ways. Um, and I think also just like the ability to manage a project effectively, but then also see the humanity in the work. Like you don't just get caught mm -hmm. up in trying to make a thing run and, and get the thing complete, but then also thinking about what are those opportunities for impact. Mm -hmm. I think definitely my planning education has, has prepared me for that and really um, being hyper aware of when those opportunities arise for impact. Um, and, and, and to do things in a sustainable way. And I think that's what allowed me to really, when thrust in that role, that's not what they wanted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They put me in that role, that's not what they wanted. They wanted mm -hmm. me to get the thing going and get it finished and move on to the next thing, but they didn't want me to halt the thing mm -hmm. and see the problem, see the, the real problem and offer a, a different solution. That's not what they wanted, but sometimes you have to go get against the grain um, and so I think also my experience of working abroad in South Africa was not an easy one. Um, you know, South Africa has its own issues around racism and injustice in the built environment. And um, for myself as a black female professional working there, it wasn't easy. And so I developed a very thick skin mm -hmm. when there and even trying to convince people there about thinking about um, the low income communities. And so I would say just like a, all of that, mm -hmm. Together, um, had prepared me to be in a, in a position where I could speak up intelligent, intelligently about things um, and be courageous in really seeing what the true issue is and saying something about it, even against the wishes of the people who are paying me for my job. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I think, and I encourage all of you in 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 that when moving forward, that sometimes. You know, whether it's uh, you're working in the private sector or you're working in the public sector, that often, some, oftentimes the, the problem that you're asked, being asked to solve is not the real <laughs> issue that you, you need to solve. And I think we're, we're trained as planners to really in, investigate history and um, the story of place. And um, I think that's an important part of really understanding the dynamics of the challenge. Um, and um, and yeah, I think that's what prepared me for the work that, that I've done. That's great. Um, if, I don't know, Sophia, you just turned on your, I don't wanna, um, but we have time for maybe one more question or, and then we should probably close if there's anything else anyone wants to say. 
Sure, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to ask the question if nobody else um, has a pressing question. Sorry, I was waiting for the garbage truck to be gone for the noise, <laughs> um, but it's, it's gone now. I think, Ifoma, um, you just brought up the idea of like sustainability and project sustainability, which I think is super interesting when we talk about ephemeral projects. And I think there's so much potential in, you know, public art projects, like, um, like programming pop-ups, some of the examples that you showed us. Um, and I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on like how best to ensure the way Bomi said, like the stickiness of a project like that, um, especially as urban designers, when we are more cons like when we're more uh, working in the design space, how we can ensure the the sustainability in terms of like the program and how the, the program keeps running with the community. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it'll require you to put on different hats. You know, yes, you'll have your urban design hat where you'll be thinking about form and, mm -hmm. and, and, and space, um, but then you'll also be putting on your planning hat where you're thinking about sustainability. And so what we did with each of those programs was we um, we inter we made sure that there was funding embedded into uh, a stewardship program so that residents could not, would, would be, would receive stipends for being a part of the process mm -hmm. and implementing the project, but then they also would be stipends for a period of like a year or so. Um, to steward the space. And then we also worked with NYCHA to develop a, a memorandum of understandings mm -hmm. they could meet at the middle, right? So residents would maintain the space up until this point or this level of scope. And then NYCHA would, would maintain it up until this point level of scope. So that was sort of our way of really addressing that challenge that you see in a lot of these spaces, which is like, okay, yeah, they look beautiful, but then are you gonna be able to maintain it over time? So the maintenance was a huge part mm -hmm. of the conversation really developing a culture of stewardship was a big part of the conversation and making sure that there were resources and support on both ends um, for that to, to be upheld. Absolutely, and I think you bring up a really good point in terms of like knowing who, who is best positioned to do the stewardship and at what point each group should be responsible for. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for that question. So it's closing in on 11 and I want to um, give students time to, to kind of take a break in between classes. Um, so I'm going to close this out and just thank you so much, um, Ifoma, for coming back to MIT, sharing your work and all of these experiences with us. It was a really incredible uh, talk and I learned a lot from it. So um, thank you so much for your generosity today. It was, it was really wonderful. No, thank you for, for um, inviting me and this retreat. Uh, to return to my alma mater, although not in person, but still there. <laughs> Thank you. And it was great to see Bomi show up here as well. Um, it was a treat. <laughs> yeah, thanks for showing up, Bomi. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.